Hi everybody, thanks for joining us today. My name is Corey and this is Archimedes and we're with the Bureau of Land Management at the Morley Nelson Snake River Birds of Prey National Conservation Area. Today we have a special presentation for you all about the Birds of Prey National Conservation Area. During this presentation we're going to take a virtual field trip out to the area to see the habitat where the birds of prey live. We're going to meet a few live birds, Archimedes and another friend, and then we're going to learn a little bit about raptor identification so that when you're outside enjoying your public land, you can use your new skills to identify what types of raptors you're seeing out there. Now, the first thing I wanna let you know about Archimedes is that he is an education bird with the BLM. He lives with us because he can't live on his own in the wild due to an injury that he has. And the Fish and Wildlife Service has given us a permit that we can use him for education. And you're going to learn a little bit more about him later in the presentation. So let's get started. So the first part of our presentation will be that field trip into the National Conservation Area. the desert ecosystem of southwest Idaho that's home to the highest density of nesting raptors in North America and possibly the entire world. This area is managed by the Bureau of Land Management, which helps protect the area for the birds of prey, as well as other cultural, scientific, and educational resources. And it also gives people a fun place to explore their public lands. Imagine a hawk, an eagle, an owl, a falcon, a vulture, or an osprey. And think about what their feet look like, their beak looks like, what their face looks like. Here we have Little Hawk. And let's talk about those characteristics that make a bird a bird of prey. So if you look at her feet, you might notice that she has these long claws at the tips of her toes. Those are called talons. And they use their talons to catch their food. Little Hawk flies around looking for food, so she has to have excellent eyesight. So all of our hawks and eagles are able to see about eight times as far as we can. Owls are able to see well in the dark. All birds of prey have excellent eyesight. And the third characteristic is their beak. They have a sharp, curved beak. And they use that to tear their food up that they've caught with their talons. So if you have a bird that has sharp talons, a sharp curved beak, and excellent eyesight, then you have a bird of prey. So Little Hawk's a Swainson's Hawk. These are migratory birds. They're around here in the spring and summer. This is where they nest, and then they go somewhere else in the winter. Swainson's Hawks can go as far as Argentina in their migration. And then they come back and do it all over again. Let's go out with my friend Jared, the critter man, and see what other types of animals he can find out here. We have the highest concentration of Paiute ground squirrels here in North America. So there's a very close food source right next to where they, they nest. Being in that close proximity to their food source doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. It's a western fence lizard. The sagebrush lizard looks a lot, quite a bit like the western fence lizard, only they don't get as big as the western fence lizard. Go for 
for snakes are a constrictor. They eat other small mammals and reptiles and things, but they they like to constrict. This is Archimedes. He's a great horned owl. Archimedes was hit by a car, and that's why he only has one eye. A great horned owl is a predator. They're pretty. They're pretty strong as far as their talons and things go. He's got a sharp hooked beak, keen eyesight. One of the main features of his eyesight is that he can see in very low light conditions. He has very large eyes that collect uh, a large amount of light. just spiritual. They are the greatest things in the air. They're mystical. People are awed by them when they see them soaring overhead. It's something that's free, it's wild, it's powerful. The Morley Nelson Snake River Birds of Prey National Conservation Area lies in this place between incredible biological resources and also an amazing amount of use. And we have the largest and densest population of nesting raptors in North America. And at the same time, it's an area that the public can enjoy. He was a falconer from age 17 to 84. He'd pick up a falcon or an eagle and he'd go, oh, big boy, oh, big I boy. I you, he would say. To oh, me. you are proud today, huh? He never had a bad day of flying birds. He came out to Dedication Point. I went down there and a prairie falcon came off the cliff right there. And then he saw golden eagles and prairie falcons all day long. So he thought the canyon was heaven. We spent a lot of time as kids out here. North Dakota on a farm. He started to notice raptors and their behavior and became fascinated and actually became a self-taught falconer. And in the late 1940s, he had an opportunity to come to Boise to work for the snow survey. He just had this thing about he had to go look for eagle nests because he had a permit with the Fish and Wildlife Service to actually possess these birds for educational and filming purposes. He started exploring the area and ended up on the Snake River Canyon and noticed that there was a higher concentration of raptors than he had seen anywhere in his life. And so he spent the next several decades working with the BLM and other interested people to really raise the awareness of this area and also to protect it. Morley just had this magical way of communicating with people about birds of prey. He'd had this infectious enthusiasm for the area, and he spread that word to everyone. Our dad gave us cameras because he wanted us to film his falcon striking game. So that's how we started. I mean, we started with Bolex cameras and 100-foot rolls. But Morley taught himself how to be a filmmaker and he said the greatest thing I can do to enhance the understanding and beauty is to, to is to show people these birds he, he was using film to change the minds of everybody in the world that these birds are not bad animals they're they're magnificent in the early days the eagle at the red tail was vermin they were all chicken hawks so it was perfectly acceptable to shoot any of them and his whole purpose was to get people to appreciate birds of prey through their beauty and majesty and therefore end that accepted practice in the 
1960s, he started working with the BLM to get some sort of protection for the area. And in 1971, the area was designated as the Snake River Birds of Prey Natural Area, which was really a first for the BLM. This is the only area in the entire world that scientific study determined the boundaries of the area being protected. The lines are not drawn by any of the political managers. It was the scientists drew the lines. Now let's go up here and take a look at the world from the Prairie Falcon's point of view. I was hired in 1972 by the BLM as the first biologist for what was then the Snake River Birds of Prey Natural Area. And my first assignment was assess the raptor population and to assess the habitat and spatial requirements of the major raptor species. Originally, we thought that they were only going to go maybe five miles from the canyon. We found out that these birds were ranging 30 kilometers, which is 18 miles. We found out the prairie falcon was using the largest space. We used that spatial data to determine how far back from the canyon should the boundaries be uh, established. We pulled together all the research from 1975 to 1979 in a report to the Secretary of Interior that identified the spatial needs of the raptors. This is the only conservation area whose boundaries were defined based on scientific information about movements of the animals and what they required to make a living. Cheryl? Good morning, Larry. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. Really? Oh, my gosh. So, here is where we keep your entire collection. For four years, looking at uh, H.R. 236. <laughs> this is the bill that was uh, introduced in May 1993. This is the Snake River Birds of Prey National Conservation Area. This protected uh, 482,000 acres of the best uh, habitat for birds of prey in North America and probably the world. I was the champion of H.R. 236. I was the uh, sponsor of the legislation and uh, made sure that we got this through after uh, three years of hard work. The table had been set for many years here in Idaho with the talk of how spectacular the birds of prey area was. And then Cecil Andrews took the action back in 1980 when he was Secretary of the Interior to withdraw the area under an executive order. So that protected the area for about 20 years, but the clock was ticking and when I got to Congress, I was elected in 1990 and we didn't pass this until 1993, but I didn't stop working on it for a minute while I was there. The fact that it was renamed the Morley Nelson Snake River Birds of Prey National Conservation Area gives recognition to a citizen who started the process. I was the guy at the end of it that took it up, but it was Morley Nelson and Cease Andrews and all the scientists and all of the users there that sort of set the table for this. I think it represents smart, bipartisan, coming together community that wanted the best for our kids and the best for the natural resources, the best for our environment and the best for the birds. It all comes together right here in this canyon. Dad went over the cliff on a rope to take a prairie falcon out of the ivory, but the hole was too small, so he had to climb back up to the top, and so he made me go down. I remember backing off the cliff like this with the rope, and I looked down, and I was absolutely petrified. And then Dad says, don't look down, look at the cliff in front of you. So I started looking at the cliff right there, backing down till I got to the hole. I crawled in and grabbed one bird, pulled him out, put him in the pack, and then they had to pull me up. I've never seen anybody more dedicated to anything than my father was to the birds of prey. He definitely reached out to a lot of people and they were more than willing to help. 
his legacy number one is this canyon. This special place belongs to all of us. The more people that can enjoy it, the better. This is a treasure of a resource that is open for everyone. I think people need to take more opportunities to get out in nature and interact with wildlife. You can't love something that you never come in contact with. One of the ways that we are going to save species, we're going to save wild spaces, is by loving them. To fly. To be able to see the view from their perspective. There's such a soul-searching attitude to them. They're the toughest birds you'll ever find. They are what makes this area what it is. The ecosystem is perfect here for the densest population of birds of prey in North America. Golden Eagle monitoring in the Snake River Canyon started around 1971. We start with an occupancy survey to see which territories are occupied. About a month later, we'll come and see how many nestlings are in each of the occupied nests. We follow up with a last check of nestlings. The geology of it, the way that everything was formed was so perfect, an ecosystem, that they came here. The most important feature, of course, is the canyon itself, where the cliffs are magnificent, high, an ideal place for nesting raptors. And then the bench lands above, those soils provide ideal conditions for burrowing rodents. We think of the canyon as the bedroom and these uplands as the pantry where they forage. Shrubs are foundational to the habitats at the NCA. Sagebrush in particular draws deep soil moisture up to the surface and traps snow. And then forbs and grasses can utilize that water. And so if you want to have all the other species, all the other components like your grasses and wildflowers, you need to start with your shrubs. Sagebrush provides the structure for this ecosystem. It provides food for wildlife. It provides habitat. The real driving factor for why we have such high densities of raptors in this area is because of the amount of prey species such as Paiute ground squirrels and reptiles, so snakes, lizards, as well as other small mammals. The ground squirrel we have out here is called the Paiute ground squirrel. It's relatively small bodied. They have an average lifespan of about three to five years. They're endemic to this area and are only above ground from late January. And then once it starts getting hot, they stay underground pretty much for the rest of the year. So they actually have to emerge from their burrows, find a mate, mate, raise their young, and then put on enough weight that they can survive the rest of the season. The reason why we have the density and diversity of raptors we have here is because of the density of prey. The Golden Eagle Monitoring Program represents one of the world's most comprehensive and longest monitoring data sets for breeding eagles. A lot of what we know about Golden Eagle ecology has come from studies conducted in the NCA. We're going into a Golden Eagle nest to look for Mexican chicken bug infestations and then also avian trichomoniasis, this disease that can cause nestling death. Golden eagles are at the top of the food chain. They're a generalist species, so they take a lot of different prey items, but here in the NCA they specialize in black-tailed jackrabbits. 
most goons live between 30 to 45 years in the wild if everything goes good. Of course, they ride the thermals like everybody sees, you know, you're floating around. But when they do come into a stoop or a dive to catch their prey, their top speed is almost 200 miles an hour. There's more power in those towns than there is in the pit bull's jaws. The name burrowing owl is a little bit of a misnomer because at least the birds out here in the western United States don't dig their own burrows. They typically nest in burrows dug by other mammals. There aren't any other owls that nest underground. They're a migratory species, so they have to survive the journey between Idaho and Mexico every year. They lay a large clutch of 12 eggs, which is very unique for a predatory bird. They'll eat everything from small mammals, rodents, down to invertebrates. They're kind of tall and slender. They hover when they fly, and they occupy these open areas. Ferruginous hawks are one of the largest hawks. They're adapted to these high country environments where the heat is relentless. They have got these huge buccal cavities, so when they want to release some of their inner body heat, they can just open up their mouth. It's a big part of the reason that they're able to survive out here. It's what they're adapted to do. They're incredibly aggressive against potential nest predators and primarily during this part of the year, hunt ground squirrels. So right around the time that the youngsters are fledging, the birds will go north into Montana or Alberta where the ground squirrels are still up. They're big movers and they follow these squirrels. They seem to prefer them. You're going to see more prairie falcons here along the Snake River than you will anywhere else in the world. Falcons are not as big of nest builders as some of the other birds of prey. And so they literally just dig down into the dirt and the rocks that are on a cliff ledge. And that's where they'll lay their eggs. And then once the chicks hatch, after they have grown in their first set of feathers, the parents start both going out to collect food because there's a lot of mouths to feed and it requires a lot of food. They're fast like a peregrine, but they've sacrificed some of their speed for size. And because of that, they can hit harder. They really can knock prey out of the sky. The NCAA supports breeding habitat for about 16 different sorts of raptors. On any given year, up to 700 breeding pairs of birds have been known to nest in this area. It's one of the densest breeding populations of raptors in the world. Nature has put together one of the most unbelievable areas in the world for birds of prey. And in that perfection, we had to protect it. Protects the birds, pre-existing uses, and provides this legacy for America to have for the rest of time. Uh, this area is really special for raptors. Um, it supports habitat for 23 different species, including hawks, eagles, falcons, owls, and vultures. Many of the raptor species here in the NCA prey on small mammals. The most important of those include black-tailed jackrabbits and Paiute ground squirrels. Reptile species are also important food items, including snakes and lizards. So now let's talk about some of the raptors that live in the NCA. First, we'll start with golden eagles. These are resident species that live in the NCA throughout their year. They nest in the Snake River Canyon. Um, breeding pairs choose a nest site um, and build giant stick nests. On these stick nests, they typically raise one to two young. After about nine weeks, these birds are fully grown and they're able to fly and leave the nest. Prairie falcons are another species that nest in the NCA. They're a migratory bird species, um, which means they only spend the spring and summer months here in the NCA, specifically to raise their young. Uh, instead of building giant stick nests like golden eagles, they find a scrape, which is kind of like a cubby hole in the canyon wall to raise their young. All right, now let's explore the plants that live in the desert ecosystem. We're going to do a desert scavenger hunt together. So we're going to walk through the sagebrush step and we're going to look for three different kinds of shrubs, something that lives in or on a shrub, 
Find a leaf with hairs, find the largest leaf, find at least two kinds of grasses, and find a hole dug by an animal. While we were walking around, we were able to see different types of plants that live out here in the desert ecosystem. And we were able to look at them and notice that they were all a little bit different. And maybe now we can think about how these plants survive in the desert. This is a sagebrush. Sagebrush is a very common shrub in Idaho and throughout the West. And sagebrush is a really important species because it provides habitat for all of the small mammals, the insects, the lizards, the other reptiles that are so important for the birds of prey species out here. Jackrabbits will make their burrows under sagebrush. The other thing that's really cool about sagebrush is they have very deep roots that extend even taller than I am into the soil. And during the really hot summer months, sagebrush can bring water to the surface. And then all of the other plants that don't have as deep as roots can utilize that soil water. This is a winter fat. And you can see that it totally looks different than a sagebrush. That's a sagebrush. This is a winter fat. But it got its name because about 100 years ago, when there were a lot of sheep ranchers out in the NCA, they would put their sheep out on the NCA for their winter range, and the sheep would eat all of the winter fat and fatten up during the winter, so that's how it got its common name. This is a native bunch grass. We really care about native bunch grasses like rice grass because they provide a good food source for the small mammals that the raptors depend on. This area is covered in the invasive grass, cheatgrass. And cheatgrass has invaded the NCA. And as you can see, it's very easy to pull up because it has very shallow, fine roots. And the reason that we're really concerned about cheatgrass is it has altered the fire cycle in the NCA. So once we have a fire that comes through and kills the native shrubs, cheatgrass really likes fire. It germinates after fire. It produces a ton of seeds. It can utilize all the spring moisture and take over areas. One of the things that BLM tries to do is restore habitat after it's burned. And this is an example of one of the restoration projects we've done. And this is a baby sagebrush that we planted last fall. And our hope is that over time we can put more shrubs back on the landscape, create more habitat, create more cover for all the small mammals and then hopefully that will help the raptors too. So here we are at the Overlook at Dedication Point overlooking the Snake River. We're about 400 feet up from the canyon floor. If you look around you'll notice there's a lot of different geology in the area. So the cliffs you're looking at are made of basalt which is a type of igneous or volcanic rock that cools above the surface and it's been laid out in layers from different volcanic activity. So as you look along the canyon, I want you to look for evidence of a volcano and you might spot Sinker Butte and it is an extinct shield volcano that erupted underwater when this whole area was covered by Lake Idaho. So the way you do a sound map is you find a nice spot to sit and you're going to record the sounds that you hear. So you can mark yourself on your sound map by drawing an X and I'm going to take some time and listen. And as I hear the sounds, I'm going to record them and then continue to listen and record the things that you hear. The river, the wind, it's up to you. So what I'd like you to do is next time you're in your yard around your apartment building or your house, or next time you visit your local park to take these activities with you and you can do your own discovery day. Thank you all so much for coming out with us today and learning about the NCA. Although our time today has been short, I hope you guys have learned a little bit about raptors in the NCA as well as our habitat. Be proud that such an amazing place is here in the state of Idaho. And next time, come and see the birds for yourself.
Okay, welcome back from our virtual field trip. Now I'm going to show you how you can take your own field trip into the NCA and learn about how you can identify some of the raptors that you'll see out there. So here's a map of the National Conservation Area. You can see here is Nampa, Boise, Cuna, and it's this big area along the Snake River, about 485,000 acres. And here's a great driving tour that's pretty easy to do in an afternoon. If you start in Cuda and you head down to Dedication Point where you'll get great overview of the Snake River, Swan Falls Dam is a beautiful place, and Celebration Park is a park operated by Canyon County, and you can see petroglyphs there. And along the way, you might see some birds of prey. So let's learn about how to identify a few major birds of prey. First thing you want to know is where the birds of prey are. Some of them migrate and some of them stay in the area all year long. So this is a good resource to show you where the birds of prey are throughout the year. First one you might see um, around dark is this type of bird that has these big pointed ears, big facial disc. You might have already seen one today. That's our great horned owl. They're in the NCA all year long. They're one of the larger owls you'll see and they have these feathers on top of their head called ear tufts. Another owl species you might see that you've already learned about today is one that lives in the ground and they live in burrows on the ground. They have yellow eyes, they're smaller in size, long legs, uh, brown colored with white on their face and that's our burrowing owl. They're here March through August. You'll likely see them on um, in big open areas, maybe in the dirt, maybe near their burrow. Another bird of prey you might see along telephone wires, a small falcon, and that's the American kestrel. They're here all year round. They're the smallest falcon that we have in the National Conservation Area. And the males and females look different. You can see the males are a little brightly colored and the females have a little bit more camouflage. Another falcon species that you might see out there is one that lives in the cliffs and nests in the cliffs. And that's our prairie falcon. So they're here February through late July. Um, the National Conservation Area is home to the highest concentration of nesting prairie falcons anywhere in the entire world. Sometimes you might see a very large bird of prey, maybe along transmission lines or power lines. You might see a, the bird soaring with large wings. And that is our golden eagle. They're in the conservation area all year long. They're the largest raptor that you'll find in the National Conservation Area. And you got to see some of those in the video as well. They're all brown with a little bit of gold at the nape of their neck. Another large soaring bird you might see in the conservation area with a red tail is our red-tailed hawk. So that's a good indication that you're seeing the red-tailed hawk is that color on their tail, but also these dark marks at the top of their wings help you identify the red-tailed hawk. They are found in the National Conservation Area all year long, and they're one of the most common and widespread hawks in North America. There's another hawk species that you'll see out there. This one has a little bit more slender wings than the red-tailed hawk, they have lighter colored feathers at the front of their wings and darker at the back. And that's Swainson's hawk, like little hawk. They're migratory, so they're only here April through September. They do like to hang out with other Swainson's hawks sometimes. And as mentioned, they can go as far as Argentina in their migration. Uh, this bird of prey is a little bit hard to see. He's right in the middle, or she's right in the middle of the picture. You can see the little bit of white patch at the base of their tail. The males and females look different. The males are the gray one with the white patch. The females are the brown ones. And these are called northern harriers. So you can see a good identification marker is that white base at the end of their tail, or at the base of their tail. And then they do have a little bit of a facial disc, not as big and wide as an owl's, but much wider than other hawks. And this is a bird of prey you'll see that sometimes hangs out with others of its same species. You'll see it flying around, holding its wings in almost like a V shape and teetering side to side. They have a featherless head that's usually red in color, and that's our turkey vulture. They're in the NCA March through August, 
They're slightly smaller than a golden eagle, but you'll still see a big dark bird soaring around if you see a turkey vulture out there. And here is a little bit of a trick one for you because it is a big dark bird, broad wings that you do see a lot of in the NCA, but it's not a raptor. And that's our common raven. So you can see common ravens don't have those sharp talons that they catch food with, and they don't have a sharp curved beak. But they do hunt a lot of ground squirrels in the NCA, and you do see a lot of them out there. Then you'll see other wildlife like our Paiute ground squirrels or whistle pigs, American badgers. The NCA is home to the highest density of American badgers in North America. Other birds nest in the area like the long-billed curlew and lots of reptiles. So, if you have any questions about any of the birds you saw today or about the National Conservation Area, you are welcome to send me an email. But a great thing to do is if you do have more questions about birds of prey is to get a book from your local library about birds of prey and that'll help you do some research to find out some of the answers. Now I'm going to show you the website where you can find a lot of these great resources that we saw today. So this is the website for the Morley Nelson Snake River Birds of Prey National Conservation Area. On the right hand side you'll see the Feather and Frontier video that we watched. You can find the full video there. And then there are also some more activities and um, guides on the right hand side of the website. So there are fun owl and raptor coloring books. There's a junior ranger that has great activities. There are some guides. There is the field trip guide, so that map that I showed you earlier. There's a wonderful guide that takes you mile by mile to show you all the important features in the National Conservation Area along the way. And then another wonderful resource that will help you when you're identifying birds out there is the Where Are the Birds? And that's where you'll find it on our website. So thank you for joining us today. I hope you had fun learning about the Morley Nelson Snake River Birds of Prey National Conservation Area and that you'll get a chance to go out and enjoy your public land and look for some birds of prey along the way.